We want to welcome you to Revive City Church. If this is your first time, welcome into the house. We're so grateful for you to be here today. <clears throat> also, I want to just welcome those who are joining us by way of internet and just because of the nature of what is happening in the world with spikes, uh, with COVID-19, also this being the time of year that people just naturally get sick with colds and flus. I've had a host of people say that they're not feeling well, and so they decided to stay home, and we appreciate them um, really honoring us and, and playing it safe. And we recognize there are some people, too, who are at risk, who are vulnerable, who have um, uh, things going on health-wise before COVID ever came along that complicates uh, their situation if they were to catch it. So I know there's a great number of people who are watching online right now, and we want to welcome you, and I want to invite you as best as possible to stop the scroll, um, stop the multitasking, unless you're a woman. A woman can do that effectively. <laughs> but if you're a man, you need to just focus in right now on this. And I want to invite you into a moment. This will probably be the last series uh, in our series of To Be Honest, and this was birthed out of your anecdotal assessment of saying this year has been the hardest year of your life. So many people have said that. Now, when you say that this has been the hardest year of your life, what I recognize is you've already gone through some stuff. <laughs> That's not to minimize what you've already experienced. But there's something about this year that has intensified there's something about this year that has drawn out and brought about pain in ways that either we've never experienced or we're experiencing in new levels. It's like, it's like the pain was always there in the background, but 2020 dialed it up from, from level two to about 11, level seven, eight or nine and it's just like if you were to turn up your radio as loud as you could, it would physically cause pain in your ears. And so what you're experiencing right now is bringing about that pain. But today I'd like for us, knowing that we're going to move into next week, being a week where we focus on Thanksgiving, is could this be a week that we draw a line in the sand of our spirits and say, we move past the pain this week. Now, I'll be honest with you, nobody knows what next week holds. Nobody knows what's in front of us and for December. I imagine there's a host of us that this is going to, we're going to throw the best New Year's Eve party we've ever thrown in our life. But who even knows if anything will change come January 1st, 2021? But what I believe is there's something inside of you that hopes. And so what I'm, I'm saying is maybe this week, maybe even today, maybe even as you walk out the building, you choose to hope. And you don't give up on hope. I found the book... Uh, of Lamentations to be extremely helpful. It's not a book you'll hear a lot of preaching on on Sunday morning. But it's in the Bible for a reason. See, a lot of times you'll go to church and they'll tell you how to get past pain, they'll get, get over pain, move into success. But sometimes I think there's power in the lament. There is healing in the grieving. And so we have to teach people how to properly grieve how to properly express their hearts to God. Now, some of us grew up in traditions and churches where it was almost sacrilegious to talk to God in such terms. We were told just to behave and be nice and basically just take it and don't say anything. But if you'll read the overwhelming evidence of Scripture, what I find is God can handle our lament. God can handle our hurt. He, he doesn't say, 
tone it down. He doesn't even necessarily say neuter it. If you'll read the psalmist and you'll read the book of Lamentation, there is no holds bar. They pour out their hearts to God. Lamentations is one of the greatest books of grief to show us and model for us how to express our true selves before God. And in the last chapter, chapter 5, and coming down to the last verses, I felt like I read verses that perfectly describe how we feel about this year. You ready to hear it? <laughs> chapter 5, verse beginning in verse number 19. You, O Lord... Remain forever, your throne from generation to generation. Here it is. Tell me if this is, feels like this year. Verse 20. Why do you forget us forever and forsake us for so long a time? Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Notice this. Renew our days as of old. What does that sound like to you? I wish we could just go back to the way things used to be. I wish we could just get back to normal. Renew our days as of old. But notice this. This is that, but we don't know what's coming moment. Unless you have utterly rejected us and are very angry with us. That's, and that's the end of the book. <laughs> that's the end of the book. It stops there. Anybody study music, like music, listen to music, can sing, can play? Any, I mean, you have any type of musical idea. Do you know what, what it means to have an unresolved chord? Anybody, an unresolved chord just bothers you? You're, there's something about an unresolved chord that just is just like, ah, oh, the song's not over yet. But it is over. But it's purposely ended in a way that leaves you with angst. I think that's the book of Lamentations. It's an unresolved chord. It's just, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like it's over. It doesn't feel like I really got past it. I wonder if there's people in my, and under the sound of my voice this morning, who feels like the pain of your life is an unresolved chord. Like it, it's... It's there in the background, and it just doesn't feel right, and I don't feel like I've got over it. And my question would be, God, why do you allow this type of pain? What is it that he's feeling forsaken for such a long time? How many now hundreds of days have we been going through this thing together? And what is it that we're asking God, can we just get back to the way things were? And I recognize there may be somebody thinking, what, the way things were, I didn't like that. I'm looking for something new. But can we all step into the moment to say, and this is true for my family, we are not even going to be gathering for Thanksgiving the way we normally would. And, and, and so regardless of what I'm saying, I'm getting back to normal. I know people are like, oh, what, what kind of normal? I, for me, like, can I just go back to where I could have Thanksgiving dinner <laughs> normally with everybody that I love? And what is it that we feel so rejected and we feel like God is angry with us? Would you allow me to do something that we don't often do in church? But would you, trust me, I promise you that nobody's going to come from the back. I promise you <laughs> this is not a setup. But would you trust me enough just to close your eyes? And can I read to you, I don't know that I have the time to read all of the verses, but in chapter 3, Jeremiah, he gives the source of this pain. Verses 1 through 20 really sum it up well. Let me read as much as I can, but if you'll just close your eyes and listen. Just focus on the words. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has led me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely he has turned his hand against me time and time again throughout the day. 
I'm going to skip to verse number seven. Verse number six. Keep your eyes closed and keep listening. See if any of this resonates. He has set me in dark places like the dead of long ago. He has hedged me in so that I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy. Even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with hewn stone. He has made my paths crooked. Verse 11. He has turned aside my ways and torn me in pieces and made me desolate. He has bit his bow and set me up as a target for the arrow. He has caused the arrows of his quiver to pierce my loins. I have become the ridicule of all my people, their taunting song all the day. He has filled me with bitterness, and he has made me to drink wormwood. Verse 16, he has also broken my teeth with gravel. The New Living Translation says it. He's filled my mouth with gravel and covered me with ashes. You have moved my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Remember my affliction and roaming, the wormwood and the gall. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. You can look at me now. Jeremiah is in the sunken place. My soul, he says, sinks within me. Now, how many of you have ever heard this phrase before? That God will not give you more than you can handle. You've heard that phrase before. God will not give you more than you can handle. How many of you think that's, well, I don't want to say it that way. Is, do you think the, the, the man who just wrote those words that we just listened to, do you think he feels that way? Do you think he feels that way? God cannot give me, does not give me more than I can handle. Now, I think I know where possibly the idea that God doesn't give you more than you can handle comes from. It actually comes from a verse in Scripture in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse number 13. It says this, No temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to to bear it. And, And for me, when I read that verse, I think what the psalmist is going through is not the same as temptation. I do believe that with every temptation in life, whatever it is you're tempted to, that there's always an escape route. You don't have to be forced into that sin. Like literally God says there's a way you can get out. But I think what Jeremiah is experiencing is so much different. This is not temptation. This is actually what he's been warning people. (laughs) He's been telling the people, you better get right with God. Or something's coming. And they didn't get right. And it came. And now he's sitting in the middle of it, observing it, saying, I told you so. But in saying, I told you so, he's experiencing the same pain that they're all going through. I don't think Jeremiah is the cause of the pain. And I know there are places in our life where we're our own worst enemies and the pain that we experience is because of our own doing. But I also know there's a host of people here that your pain is not a part of your doing. It's a part of someone else's doing. Or it's a part of the world that we live in. And so in that, that type of pain... There's no avoiding it. There's no dodging it. Pain is something every person deals with at some point during their time on earth. And our response to pain varies. How many people know people who are hypersensitive to pain? You know people who are hyper, I mean, they're a little extra. 
And how many of us, you know, people, or maybe you're a type of person where you have a tolerance. You have a high tolerance for pain. We all deal with pain differently. Some people work through it. Others are paralyzed by it. Some people, and I feel like this is a big part of who we are as a church, some people spend their time trying to self-medicate. I was reading this week, and I was thinking about my honey boo, because I'm so proud of her. She's doing such a great job, and I was thinking about how she is a blessing to me and my children, to our church, to her friends. And I was reading Proverbs 31 because I was thinking about my honey. I feel like she's a Proverbs 31 woman. But I've forgotten the, the beginning of that proverb. It's a mother talking to her son. And look what she says to her son. She says, give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Proverbs chapter 31 is talking about people who are self-medicating. They're talking about people who are drinking and, and taking strong drink to forget their sorrows. And, and, I, and from the language of Scripture, this is what I would say. When you abuse any type of substance, that every extra drink you take is a, is a every hit is a concession. What are you conceding? That life is not worth living. Isn't that what it says? Give strong drink to him who's perishing. Whoever bitter heart, let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Every hit, every extra drink is a concession, conceding that life is not worth living, that life cannot get better. And so you just want to numb yourself to everything and forget everything because you would, you would say it's better just to feel nothing than to feel the pain. And what really burdens my heart is that you would rather say, I would rather feel nothing because of the pain, but in feeling nothing, there are good things that you're neglecting yourself from. There's good feelings. There is things worth living for that you have forgotten about because of the things you feel like aren't worth living for. So what happens, this pain causes us to get stuck. And at some point, maybe you have asked yourself this question. Why would God create pain? If there's a loving God, <laughs> why does he cause or allow bad things to happen to good people is the way I've heard it all my life. And that has to be one of the biggest questions in Christianity you know, again, how could a good God, how could a loving God allow so much pain and suffering in the world? All he would have to do, you know, is just change some things. Change our weather patterns so we wouldn't have tornadoes and so we wouldn't have earthquakes. Earthquakes Change the patterns of our, sail, our cells so that our body doesn't cause cancer or other diseases. How could a good God allow so much pain? And that's a great question. And again, maybe you grew up in a church or a tradition where they're like, shh, don't talk about that. <laughs> You're not allowed to ask questions like that. I think the Bible allows us to ask questions like that. This is with the, the heart of, the, of the, the man who's writing this lament. God, why are you allowing this? Will there ever be an end to this, this pain? This is a great question. Why is God allowing the pain? And I don't know if you've asked it before, but I will be honest to say I've asked God similar questions. And here's what I've discovered. God is bigger than my questions. God is bigger than my pain. God is God. God is sovereign. And if God is sovereign, that means there must be purpose for your pain. There's a purpose for your pain. I want to say this carefully, because you're looking at me like, ah, where are you going? I would say 
that pain is not all bad. Pain is not all bad. I've said this before. It's such a powerful quote. I want to, I want to mention it again. C.S. Lewis, brilliant, apologetic, apologist, said, pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. There are things that you have inoculated yourself to, things that we don't pay attention to naturally, that we're, we're, we don't hear, we don't listen. Anybody raise kids and know kids can, they can hear, but they, but they don't always listen? I, you, I, I'm saying, I'm saying, it's right there. I'm saying, hey, I need you to get that. I'm saying, you need to come back here. They hear, don't you tell me they don't hear. They hear it. They got perfectly good ears that work, but they're not listening. That Now, never these, you know, pretty girls here in the front row, but my kids, my kids, they hear, they're not listening. And, and I think there are things God is saying and God is revealing and God is showing us, but we're not listening. So just like a parent may lovingly say, Whew. everybody okay with me saying that today? That's how it was me growing up. You may choose to do something different, but when I was growing up, it was, Whew. and cause a little pain. I'm not talking about abuse. Don't get me wrong. That's wrong. I'm just talking about a little pain. A little, a little wake up. And suddenly, guess what? I'm now listening. You got my attention. The pain woke me up. And so, there is some pain, or there is a part of pain that can be used for good. Do you know that if it wasn't for hunger pains, you could starve to death? You could not be um, having all the nutrients that you need, but your body causes your stomach to have pain because you need to eat. Do you know, without pain, there would be so many important things in life that we maybe wouldn't follow after. I would like to give you my testimony today that if it wasn't for pain, I may not be a true follower of Christ. Without pain, I, 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 I may have just continue to do life my way. I, I, I would have I would just rebelled and did whatever it is that I wanted to do, but the pain that came with the rebellion, it, 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 it pointed me that this way is not the right way. I know we like that the end of the story that's all good. I know we want to get to the story without the pain, but if I can remind you about Jesus, there was no resurrection before there was a Good Friday. There, there was no crown before there was a cross. In fact, or if I can say it this way, to be honest, let me say something that may further cloud your, the argument of pain. And I want you to hear me correctly because I believe we'll resolve this chord when we get to the very end in just a moment. I would like to present to you that pain and suffering can actually be a part of God's will. The question is, how will you process the pain? Do you see the significance in your pain? Now, I've been saying pain, but let, let's get, what are we talking about? Relational pain, anybody going through that? Financial pain, come on, I can get a witness on that, can I? Emotional pain, Depression, anxiety, fear, addiction, loneliness, illness, sickness. I would imagine in this room, if we could put all our pain up on this platform, we wouldn't have room for me to walk around. And if I sat down with you, and in a sense, that's what we do every Sunday morning. We sit down, like we're sitting down across from the table having coffee. It, I don't think it would take very long for us to really start talking about pain. Now, I know there are some people in life, they, they, they do that, and you're like, hey, I didn't want to hear about all that. <laughs> I 
how are you doing? Well, well, my back hurts here, and I got this bunion on my foot. No, we didn't need, we didn't need that. But when you're walking in true relationship with somebody, you know when someone's in pain. You see it on their face. You see it in their actions and their behaviors. And you can't help but say, hey, what's going on? And how many of you, like me, I just wish God would give me a heads up when the pain's about to come. Could you just give me a heads up? Because if, Lord, if you would just give me a heads up, I could plan for it. I'd be like, all right, it's the third week of November. We're going to go through some stuff, all right? So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start praying now, all right? I'm going to start praying now. I'm going to to start reading the Bible a little extra. I'm going to start hanging out with Pastor Gordon, you know what I mean, because he he probably don't go through that kind of stuff. I'm going to get around him because he lives that Christian, that perfect Christian life. I'm going to hang out with all the church people, and it's going to be awesome because I'm going to be ready for the pain. But it doesn't happen that way. Usually... We're blindsided by the pain. All right. Let me tell you what I'm saying. Let me try to illustrate it. Uh, not too long ago, I had some tooth pain. Isn't that, isn't that bad pain? That's some of the worst, the worst pain. And I end up going to the dentist and having to, get, uh, having to get a root canal. Not just any kind of root canal, but on my molar where there's like three roots, okay? So it's like three different times in that root. And what, are the, what does the doctor, what does the dentist tell you? If you feel any pain, let me know. Now, you got a mouth full of stuff. And so you can't talk to him. So you may make some noises, but if you move your mouth too much, you're just going to cause more pain. So he'll say something like, well, just kind of like raise your hand. Now, I can tell you after the sermon, because I'm not trying to put anybody on blast on the Internet, hello. But this was the worst dentist I've ever been to in my life. The worst dentist. And so there was a couple times he got down in there, and it was like the most excruciating pain. And so I would put my hand up to say stop. And this is the best I could describe it. It was like he only had a little bit more left to do. So instead of stopping right then and there, he went to go get that last little bit, and then he'd stop. It was the most excruciating experience when it comes to teeth I've ever had in my life. Now, what happens when you have a bad experience like that? You don't go back. Matter of fact, not only do you not go back, sometimes you're like, I'm not going to any dentist. I'm not going to the dentist. Is that a good um, diagnostic? Is that the right thing to do? What could actually happen by determining, because I had a bad experience of pain, and now I'm just going to numb myself, I'm not going back to it to get it worked on, what could possibly happen? It can actually get worse, can it? Am I helping anybody this morning? Do you see where I'm going here? I'm not, I'm, this is not rocket science. Because I had a painful experience that I didn't like, what I say is I want to just, I just want to avoid it completely. But what I do in avoiding it completely, I make it worse. Oh, I'm talking about lamentations this morning. I make it worse. And then what happens is I wait so long, oh, help me, that it's the middle of the night now. And you can't find a dentist open in the middle of the night. But I'm going through so much pain that now I have to take emergency procedures to get rid of the pain. And I wonder how many of us, if we could have just dealt with the pain on a a schedule, if we could just deal with the pain on a daily basis, I wonder if instead of trying to avoid it, if we could just go into it, rush into it, and say, I want to deal with the little things before they become the big things. I wonder how many emergencies in our lives we could have avoided if we wouldn't have avoided the pain. So where I found myself in this situation 
was in Jewish hospital on a bed saying, doctor, I don't care what you do. Pull the thing out, whatever. Take my jaw off. <laughs> and, and, and then he start talking in doctor language. And I just want to say, are you, are, you, are you saying I have to leave with this pain? He said, no, I wouldn't do you that way. So what he did, now brace yourself. So what he did, he got the biggest needle I've ever seen in my life. And there's a nerve right here. And he had to go all the way in and hit that nerve to get rid of the pain. And I wonder how many people this morning have found yourself at your last nerve. And you don't know how much more you can take or how much more you can go through. And you're like, I don't care what I do. I just got to get rid of this pain and before you know it there are extreme things happening that you are cutting off that you are getting rid of that you are saying I don't need that I just need no pain wow let me make it personal and you may be thinking Pastor Kirk that's all good I, I hear what you're saying but you don't understand the pain my pain, I wish it was physical pain, but my pain's emotional pain, or my pain's spiritual pain, or my pain is relational pain. And those are the type of pain that you don't necessarily have treatments for. And as the pastor of this church, I have sat on the front row of our members as they have walked through some of the most painful experiences of their lives. I have walked through violence and murder, and disease, and overdose, and tragedy. It's a part of the calling on my life to walk pe with people when they are in the valley of the shadow of death. And I have walked through this valley of this church that we started from scratch. And we've walked through a $100,000 investment gone in one day because of a, a lack of a sprinkler system. And we've walked through going to, uh, to grow and to multiply for the school to shut down in the middle of the year. And we've gone to get back up on our feet and, and make disciples for the school to be shut down again because of COVID-19. And not to have a place of our own. And And... I'll be honest with you, this has been partly the hardest year of my life because the, the question is, when will the pain ever end? And it's just in moments like that, and I need to land this plane if they'll help me. It's in moments like that that the greatest temptations of life come. And so I, I'll tell you this little story, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be done. And, and if you're a guest, when I say I'm going to be done, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my way of talking, psyching myself up into finishing. And so uh, there's two men come to my house, and they say, hey, we want to hear about your, your church and your ministry. And they're, they're sitting across the table, and I'm telling them all about our church. I'm telling them about you, and I'm telling them about what our, our God is doing in our ministry, and I'm telling them about how I'm excited and and this is all in the middle of the pain. And then they call me later and they say, uh, you know, we, we, weren't asking, <laughs> we weren't asking about your ministry because we want to invest in your ministry. We were asking because we want you to come be a pastor at our church. And it's one of those big churches down south. Uh, I'll say it this way to give you perspective. Some of the people who own Chick-fil-A go to that church. And it's when you're going through some stuff. <laughs> and it's when you're hurting. And, we, and it's like when you're saying, I don't know when the pain is ever going to stop. You start going, oh, that looks mighty good. And you start lying to yourself. You know what you start saying? 
I bet you they don't have problems down there. The reason they're recruiting you is because they got problems. <laughs> they got an empty position filled <laughs> to fill. That's a problem. That's why they're recruiting you. But, before, but you start lying to yourself because of the pain. When's this pain ever going to end? And you're like, man, it may be, it, the grass may be greener on the other side. Can I, can I teach you a lesson in life? The, if the grass is greener on the other side, which many times it's not, but if it is, it's because they watered their grass. So instead of looking at the grass on the other side, start watering your grass. Instead of looking at somebody else's plate, eat, eat what's on yours. And I'm grateful to God that I walk with people like this man up front, one of our pastors of our church, and, I, and other mentors and coaches in my life, and, and some key people in this church who've been with us from the beginning. I'm glad that I could unload and offload on them on what I was going through because it brought healing and it brought health. And by the grace of God, and I'm not trying to be the hero of the story because Jesus is the hero. By the grace of God and because of the goodness of Jesus, I'm here today. And by the way, we had seven people over the past three weeks who come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I believe God broke through in my life. And I believe the greatest days of this church is yet to come. And I'm telling you, I'll face it through the pain. I'll face it through the pain. And so whatever the pain is that is driving you to think it's greener on the other side or it would be better if I just went back to what I used to do or I'll just drop these people, or I'll drop this relationship and try to look for something new or something better. What I'm saying is God may have allowed that pain for a purpose. And if you'll just look back in the rear view mirror, of whatever the pain may be, abuse, death, despondency, divorce. The girl that you thought, man, she's the one, but she wasn't the one. The one that turned and left you and left you in pain. That child that is doing, going astray and doing whatever they want to do and you can't do anything about it because they're grown now or they think they're grown. The company that you thought it's okay, they're going to be for you, they're going to, they're going to stand up with you. And then they laid you off. The landlord that is selling your house even though you've been a faithful tenant for 10 years. The pain, the suffering. I want to tell you that every time I've experienced intense pain or uh, different levels of pain, different stages of pain and different uh, appearances of pain, I want you to know that ultimately every time with that pain, every time the pain grows, every time my faith grows. And through the pain God has shown me, and through the doubts, and through my questions, and through my concerns, and through even my anger at God, God has, every time the pain has been ratcheted up, he's ratcheted up also my hope, he's ratcheted up also my faith, and ultimately he's ratcheted up my praise for him. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. If we didn't have pain, we wouldn't have done so many things or we haven't have moved in so many ways. We would have laid there numb. We would have laid there deaf. We would have laid there and never moved into the destiny that God has for us. We would have never have moved on to what we never could have imagined was in front of us. So pain is inescapable, but it also is indescribable. Because we know that God works all things together for our good. And so many times he uses the pain. So when I look back at my life, do I have questions? Oh, yeah. Is it still painful to talk about? Yes, it is. Can I even get angry talking about it? Yes. But God can take your anger. And God is big enough to take your questions. And what you need to learn is to move from asking why me to start asking what now? What is the purpose for this pain? And that's where Jeremiah gets. See, I stopped in verse number 20. 
But in the white space between verse 20 and verse 21, God does something inside of Jeremiah's soul. And he says, this I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Do you get the impression that he's talking to himself? Do you know every once in a while, it's healthy to talk to yourself. Other people may think you're crazy, but there's nothing more mentally sane than telling yourself what to hope in. Telling yourself where to place your mind and your affection and place your mind, your thoughts on things that are above. There's nothing more sane than telling your brain what your situation is and what it will be instead of allowing the unhealthiness of your own brain to lead you to places that you shouldn't be. I'm saying you, your mind controls you. Do you control your mind? I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It's through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. You're like, what are you talking about? I'm going through pain. If you're still here, he's not done with you yet. See, dead people don't feel pain. <laughs> I better keep going. Dead people don't feel pain. That pain should be a reminder that God's got a purpose for me for this day. That pain is a reminder that he is not finished with me. And the writer of Ecclesiastes said that a living dog is better than a dead lion. And I may not be like everybody else. I may not have what everybody else has had. And I may have to walk with a limp, but I'm walking by the grace of God. And he's not done with me. And everything they said is not true because what God said is true. So that's why I recall it to my mind. And that's why I have hope. Because his compassions fail not. They may fail you. Body may fail you. Health may fail you. Finances may fail you. But he's not going to fail you. Why? Because they're new every morning. Every morning you see that sun rise on the horizons. I want you to know his grace can rise up in your heart and your life and you can start over again. The Lord is my portion. What you'll discover is when God is all you have, God is all you need. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. That's him talking to himself. Therefore, I have hope in him. And then, last three verses. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. And this is a disservice to us in our English language. Because in the original language, every single one of these verses, verse 25, verse 26, verse 27, start with the word good. When we translate it, it changes it so we can understand it in English. But in the original, every single one, good it is for those who wait. Good it is that we should hope and wait quietly. Good it is for a man to bear the yoke. you saying, what are you saying? Don't you see it? Do you remember those verses I read to you? Where I had you close your eyes and I was reading all that stuff? This is the same chapter. But right in the middle of this chapter... Notice the change to what is good. The pain moves to the purpose, and then the purpose moves to a passion, and the passion now moves to what God has for their life, and that is God has good through the pain. Good it is for those who wait for him. Good it is for those who hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Good it is for man to bear the yoke of his youth. So what God is saying here, I know you're feeling that weight, and I know you're waiting, and I know you're trying to be patient, and it's a good thing. Because those are the people I do the greatest miracles for. Pain can be productive because pain can cause me to do things. It can lead us to be followers of Christ. It can, we can realize that, that there's a division between ourselves and God. We can realize that what has been 
going on in our life is not working best for our life. The pain of trying this or trying that, it doesn't work. But the pain leads me to bow my knee to Jesus, who ultimately took the greatest pain on the cross. So, in summation, Paul, when he was thinking about this pain, he said in Romans 5, because we know that the suffering, that's pain, produces perseverance. So here's what Paul was saying. Suffering, pain is going to produce pressure. And the choice is what you allow that pressure to do to you. Pressure can bust your pipes. It's a mess, isn't it? But don't you know, pressure also takes coal and make it into diamonds. So this morning, here's my challenge to you. You can be busted pipes or you can be diamonds. The choice is yours. What are you going to do with that pain? What are you going to do with that pain? What I think we learn through lament is that we express the pain and we turn our pain to God. And when we turn our eyes to God, we get a full revelation of who we are. And so I ask you this question. Can you allow the pain that you are experiencing right now turn your attention back to a loving God? Our eyes are closed. Our heads are bowed.